Ed, thank you all for coming today. It's so great to see a nearly end-to-end -end correspondence of people to chairs. It's just something like, in an OCD way, very satisfying about that. So thank you for being exactly the right number of people to show up for this talk. Um, all right, so I'm going to tell you uh, in a fairly quick fashion what this book is about, give you some highlights, give you the thesis, and uh, hope, implore you, uh, demand that you challenge me uh, and we have a chance to really talk about it. I know that, as Vince Hirsch says, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So um, if uh, you want to jump in in the midst of it, we're a cozy group here. Don't let the soporific setting on the lights uh, deter you. Feel free to raise a hand or look pained or otherwise uh, jump in as we go. So let me just frame the discussion with the observation that in North Korea, the radios can only be set by law to one of three stations. It's like the Kim Jong-il party hour, the Kim Il-sung adventure hour, and rhythm and blues. And like, your radio is not allowed to be tunable, tunable to any other frequency. Which is why some people in South Korea have come up with the idea of solar-powered radios with a standard FM tuner knob that they would then put onto balloons and float across the demilitarized zone to liberate the peoples of North Korea from technological mandates. So I just want you to think about that fact as I tell you a little bit more of some of the history that shows a trajectory of information technology that I think is about very much to change. The first part of this trajectory, and this is the historical part, is a movement from what I call sterile technologies to generative technologies. And I'll define those more by example than by stipulation, but I'm happy to give you more precise definitions as well. I warned you it'd be history. This man is Herman Hollerith, and in 1880, he was a clerk for the United States Census Bureau, responsible for helping to tally the number of people in the United States. In 1880, it took seven and a half years to do this, dangerously close to the 10-year interval at which the census was done, and he figured there had to be a better way. And inspired by these two things, on the left, the Chicard loom with holes that indicate where the weaving should go, and on the right, a simple train ticket, where a hole punched can tell you both the privileges and limitations uh, of the holder of the ticket. He came up with the idea of this, a simple card in which an interviewer for the census could punch holes in the card and indicate your nationality and your spouse's nationality, and then you could take the cards and put them through this, Hollerith's automatic tabulation machine, which would have little bolts of electricity go through the holes, incrementing counters, one counter for each possible hole on that section of card. And before you know it, in fact, only two years in the 1890 census, you could tally the number of people in the US. He wasn't only a technical genius. He was an entrepreneur par excellence. Instead of selling these machines to the government, he rented them at a cost of $50,000 per machine per year. Very smart guy. Now, in exchange, it was his responsibility from soup to nuts to make the thing work. If there was a problem in the count, what the government was renting from him was the count. And it was up to Hollerith to make the thing work. So this is a very powerful technology, but one held closely by Hollerith and rented at first to the US government and later to other governments and to insurance companies and banks and railroads for heavy duty computing uses. Hollerith's company was eventually merged with International Business Machines, renamed to that, and after a brief detour into the sale of semi-automatic rifles by Browning in the 1930s, IBM returned to its business roots. And this card is the direct ancestor of this card, the kind of card that you put into stacks like this with the diagonal lines so that if a frenemy of yours should scatter them across the land, you'd have a hope of putting them back in roughly the right order, and then feed them into machines like this, the IBM System 360. This is a machine that is a direct descendant of the automatic tabulating machine. And in its heyday, you rented its services rather than buying the machine. The services were provided by people working for IBM in the Hollerith model. And despite the fact then that it was a general purpose computer, depending on what was on those cards, it could do pretty much anything as a Turing machine. It was what I would call a sterile technology because it's not going to give birth to new and interesting things without the help of men in lab coats. This is a machine that won't give you surprises. Third parties cannot easily code upon it. In fact, second parties, the <laughs> customer, can't easily code upon it. It also has this kind of feeling of like, if you come near me, I will kill you. It's like one of these warranty void of screw removed devices that doesn't lend itself to whimsical experimentation. A serious machine for a serious purpose. Here's another technology from the 20th century that, in my view, is also sterile, 
even though it flips some of the characteristics of the System 360. The Friedman Flexor Writer was like a royal typewriter, but along the side it had this space where you could thread a tape. And as you typed, not only would it appear here, but holes would appear in the tape. You could then take the tape, put it back through, and like a player piano, it would type up here whatever was on the tape. It also meant that with scissors and glue, you could cut and paste your way to uh, a mail merge more easily than you could with Microsoft Word. <laughs> this machine is come near me, right? This is meant for secretaries, for non-techies to be able to use. In that sense, it's an appliance. But it's sterile because it's not a general purpose computer. There's nothing on the tape that can reprogram the way the machine works. The only thing that goes on the tape is data, which spills out the top of the machine. It'll work the same way when you throw it out after 10 years of use as it did the day you took it out of the picture, uh, out of the uh, package, sorry. The picture's right here. This is the descendant of the Friedman Flexor Writer after it got bought by Burroughs. And here later is the brother, smart word processor of the 1980s. Anybody write a term paper on this thing? Something like it? Yeah, good times, right? The brother, smart word processor, an information appliance. By the way, I see one chair here and one chair here. So feel free to have a chair or two. Um, there's another one over here. Here's the main menu to the brother smart word processor. Everything a consumer might want to do in one convenient grid. Why we have word processing and address book and yes, desktop reference. These are things provided through a market to people who make demands upon that market. But what you see is only mediated through brother. They decide, big brother, what you're going to want and then offer it to you and it has the sterile appliance model of what you see is what you will get. And there's no way for you, even if you're an enterprising nerd, to easily reprogram this and certainly to share that with less enterprising un-nerds. This all changed in 1977. Images from the time are blurry, but this is Steve Jobs <laughs> at the West Coast Computer Fair with an E on the end, described as 10,000 walking, talking computer freaks. He's demoing here the Apple II personal computer. For the first time in one convenient plastic molded case, you could have a general purpose computer like the 360 that didn't threaten to kill you. You could get near it like you could a flexor writer. When you turn this thing on, what did you see? A blinking cursor. The ultimate, where do you want to go today? So you could type like 10, print high, 20, go to 10, right? Good times. And then 10, print high, semicolon, Ooh, cool, right? You could also program stuff and share it with others who would be scared to even do that. And that's what gives rise to the concept of third-party software on a personal computer. So in 1979, two years after this event, Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston came up with VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet ever. And it ran on the Apple II. And people, businesses, went nuts over it. Finally, what we've been waiting for, the spreadsheet. And they start buying tons of Apple IIs. Apple II, Apple has no idea why that there's been this spike in sales. Because they had nothing to do with VisiCal. They had to do market research to figure out why they were such a success. That's part of the generativity of a platform that allows unaccredited, unaffiliated third parties to innovate without any gatekeeping by Steve Jobs or by any of his contemporaries. <laughs> so this, of course, is uh, Bill Gates, pictured here from another event in 1977, his historic traffic stop in Albuquerque, New Mexico. What I like most about this photo is, first, he is grinning from ear to ear, knowing that he'll buy and sell us all someday. <laughs> and second, that his sense of fashion has not changed significantly in 30 years. It is the smiley slightly non-law-abiding, asocial, poorly-dressed nerd that is the engine of the generative movement and that brings us the information revolution. And it's people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates who brought us and then brought us the software upon machines like these, the general purpose personal computer. What are they going to do with it? We have no idea. Just set it out there and they'll come up with something. This machine dates from about 1992, 93. How do we know? Because of the 66 light in the corner. What happens if you push the button next to the 66 light? Turbo. Turbo, yes. <laughs> the hamsters run twice as fast on the wheels inside the machine. Good question, why shouldn't they always run twice as fast? 
I guess it could affect your Prince of Persia game or something. Um, I can't help but tell you that they've actually now invented a hamster-powered paper shredder. So you can put the paper in the top and the hamster runs here on the wheel and uh, then it can live in the paper below. So it just shows you that reuse is a viable alternative to recycling. But we digress. The main function of that PC from 92, 93 has not changed in the intervening years. And that is you hand it code, it runs the code, Nobody has anything to block or intervene that feature. And if we want to share code among us, great, no problem. That's the off-the-shelf software market. That's the shareware and freeware market. That's ultimately the free software movement expressing itself even through PCs and consumers. That's a movement from sterile to generative. Now, there's this another parallel movement from sterile to generative in the network space. This is CompuServe circa 1995, I'd say. And look at the menu. Just like the brother smart word processor. You sign up for CompuServe, you're not just getting on-ramp to network connectivity, you are getting what they hope is what you want, mediated through market forces. They have competitors like AOL and the source. And then they have a committee that sits down. What content shall we invest in and groom and package and come up with cute icons for and big buttons so you can just elbow the mouse over to the right place and click? And then what you see when you click sports, CompuServe decides, again, trying to help you, but it's only CompuServe that mediates what's going to happen on this service. Now that changes when a network designed with utterly different precepts and for a different audience bursts truly unexpectedly into the mainstream. These are three of the founders of the internet, uh, John Postel, Steve Crocker, and Vint Cerf, pictured for their 25th anniversary Newsweek retrospective. Um, they're showing, uh, by the way, they were classmates together, the same high school in Van Nuys, California. Um, we might have had like the French club or the debate club in our high schools. They had to like, let's build a global network club. And whoever the refreshment chair was, congratulations. Um, they're showing you can basically build a network out of just about anything. And um, I, I confirmed with Vint last week in Washington, uh, I was puzzled because their network doesn't work. It goes from his ear to his ear and his mouth to his mouth. And I was like, that's an inside joke, right? It's not that the framers of the internet don't know how to string tin cans together. And um, he assured me that it was. Not sure I believe him. So uh, anyway, their architecture is such that because they didn't need to have a business model, nor even the truck rolls needed to build a big network, it meant that in their architecture, anybody can join the network by joining anybody already on the network. You can expand it at the edges, you can expand it at the middle, expand it wherever you want. Something that CompuServe, just it wouldn't even enter the imagination. You'd have people piggybacking on other people's CompuServe access. A little more formally, they have hourglass architecture, the idea that you want to be ecumenical about what media physically the network will run on because they don't have ownership of any of the media involved, so just come one, come all, BYO cable. And then at the top it's broad because they have no particular supposition about what you're going to use it for. It's just designed to hook people together. It's up to them to figure out what to say. Now that's obvious, but at the same time, profound. There's no main menu to the internet. That's kind of weird. You jack in and there's no menu. What? There's a blinking cursor in essence that's like, who do you want to communicate with today? So a network with no plan for content, with no CEO, with no business model, ends up having far more content than what the firm mediated polyarchical model would produce using rational investment. This, I think, is a real surprise. Another feature, of course, of uh, the network uh, in the internet model is don't keep revising it to make more features, right? We don't want Microsoft Word version 8. It looks like you're writing a ransom note. Would you like help with that paperclip? It's just like, no, move the bits to where they're going. Let the people more or less be the network. Pass things like a bucket brigade rather than hiring an external party to run it from one end of the room to the other. And more or less, you can get it working. Best efforts routing, otherwise known as send it and pray for every packet and adventure. That's crazy. And that's why, for many years, internet architects have said that their mascot, if they had one, would be the bumblebee. 
the fur to wingspan ratio of the bumblebee is clearly far too large for it to really fly. And similarly, IBM, as late as 92, was saying you couldn't possibly build a corporate network out of TCP IP. You need the IBM proprietary solution to work. And yet, somehow, the bee flies, and the network works and scales. Probably say the same about 802.11, wireless functionality. I'm actually pleased to tell you that not long ago, they figured out how bees fly. <laughs> Enough government investment will teach you anything. Uh, we don't have time today, but they basically flap their wings very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so just like there's hourglass architecture for the network, I say there's hourglass architecture for the endpoint, for the PC. And frankly, I don't care what's in the middle of the hourglass. It might be free software. It might be supposedly proprietary software, which in many respects is. I don't mean to like put that in scare quotes. But for my purposes, Windows is generative. It allows unaffiliated third parties to write whatever code they want to run on that box, and Bill Gates has nothing to say about it, which gives you the same kind of hourglass, the physical instantiation of the machine, or the software you choose to run on it, limited only by your imagination and that of the people who are sending you software. You put the generative net together with the generative PC, and you end up then with the explosion of the late 1990s of facilities, many of which were started by poorly dressed, asocial, smiley teenagers with a little bit of mischief. Where else could two guys from the Netherlands decide to destroy the music industry by coming up with Kazaa? And when they were done, before the smoke has fully cleared, they're like, who should we take on next? How about the telephone industry? They invent Skype, the same guys, right? And when they're done with Skype, they're like, let's take on TV. It's time for Juiced, right? That's only thanks to these hourglass architectures where you can route bits arbitrarily to whomever you want and run arbitrary code on PC endpoints. Or how about a band named Jimbo coming up to you in 2001? I got a great idea. An encyclopedia for the world. We start with seven articles. Then anybody can edit anything at any time. Huh? <laughs> right. Your reaction would be like, thanks, Jimbo. I'll pass on that one. <laughs> and yet somehow the B flies. I'm pleased to say it, there's now Wikipedia on this Chinese restaurant menu. You can have stir-fried Wikipedia, <laughs> stir-fried Wikipedia with pimentos, or steam eggs with Wikipedia. <laughs> I have a theory as to how this happened, which I'll share in question and answer if you want. But my point here is not it's the meal that anybody can edit. It's um, that this has really entered the public imagination. What, what <laughs> That's a great question, isn't it? Answer, whatever you want. <laughs> if you don't like it, just change it. So um, I've been talking about generativity at these layers, but when you start to bring Wikipedia in, you realize that generativity down here can recursively lead to generativity up here, to a content project that unaffiliated third parties can contribute to and build miraculous things with that didn't come about through comparative, market-mediated, still polyarchical processes. And really, up to the social layer, you can see innovations as well. I don't know if anybody here uses couchsurfing.net. Yes, this is the project, why didn't we think of it sooner, to pair up the latent market demand between people who want a couch to sleep on in a foreign city and people with couches in foreign cities who are desperate for someone to sleep on them for free, right? Of course there's a market there, and you have over a quarter of a million happy couch surfers doing this. Now, if you haven't heard of couch surfing before, my guess is your first reaction to this, as you're thinking about it and internalizing it is, how many people have been killed by couchsurfing.net? <laughs> and that's a good question. Similarly, as I was singing the praises of Wikipedia, you're like, yeah, but there's vandalism. And I agree, for each of these generative instrumentalities that in large part depend on the mischief of the nerds being kindly, cool mischief, rather than truly evil, destroy your life mischief, you start to ask as they get more and more popular how sustainable it is. And that problem recurses all the way down that generative stack as well. And in fact, I think we may be at the point where we see a movement from generative back to sterile precisely because of those kinds of problems. So just working our way down the stack quickly, it was only 2005, not that long ago, that Business Week was like, you may not have heard of blogs, but they're going to change your business. 
I know, they started off whimsically, kind of crazy, right? People would do blogs about their cats. It's always cats, porn and cats. And, you know, sure enough, this is my favorite cat-oriented blog. <laughs> cats that look like Hitler.com. Um, I don't know if any of you has visited the Kittler site or contributed something to it. Here are the top four Kittlers. <laughs> Can I just say, I think number four really takes the cake. It's like, that's just incredible. But then it gets more serious, and you end up with political blogs. So some guy, Joshua Michael Marshall, decides to start a blog and hire some reporters, and before you know it, he's getting the U.S. attorney scandal going. Or people in Myanmar are blogging their experiences as there's a crackdown and sneaking out their observations on USB keys. A lot of technical people are like, I don't get blogs either. Like, we've had home pages since, like, 1994. What's the big deal? Part of the big deal is content management systems that let non-nerds share in this generative content or social layer enterprise without having to know anything about HTML. And that's the kind of interesting innovation, possibly even you might say democratization, although it's a tricky word, brought about by the technology. Global Voice is another great example of blogging going from the cats into the far more uh, uh, broad and interesting and political and social. Now, of course, part of the fun of blogs is comments. And as blogs get more and more popular and comments provide a way to link to somewhere, it then makes sense to try to game the comments if you're an evil spammer trying to advertise pharmaceuticals. This is taken from my own blog, which is not about Ambien. And um, the robots just leave these comments. And if they end up in the uh, uh, queue and posted, the Google robot comes along, sees my links back to these sites, and figures, all right, well, Oxford is linking to these sites. These must be reputable sites worthy of Google Karma. So the net fights back. How do they fight back? In part, through the CAPTCHA, the squishy green word that a computer can generate, but paradoxically is a one-way function. Cannot figure out what it is if it wasn't the one to generate it. I put this on my blog and I say, I welcome all comers, but at least be a person. You have to be a human to post on my blog. That's the kind of standards I have. And so type this word in, and then you can post on my blog. So then the spammers get clever. As Louise von Ann at uh, CMU has pointed out in some spectacular research that earned him a genius grant, I think, but he got the genius grant. That's my inference that this is what did it. Um, for one thing, they start out with a distributed network hiring humans to solve CAPTCHAs all day long. Just sit there and solve CAPTCHAs, and as you solve them, they're going back to the respective blogs to provide answers for the robot to leave the spammy thing. But it still costs $2.50 an hour. That's too much. The spammers get even more clever. They devise applications and websites with free porn. You put up a website with free porn, instantly people apparate to visit the website. Before you give them the picture, you say you have to type the word that you see. Where do you get the image comprising the word that they see? From my blog, where they're about to leave a scammy comment. They put the image over here, the person types the answer, they take the answer, put it back on my blog, leave the comment. Everybody's happy. They see their porn, they get their comment and the spammers win. Yes? Have you seen documented cases of this? Documented cases of this. The only documented cases I have of this in the footnotes of the book are one, Louise Von Ann telling me so, and two, a BBC story at bbc.co.uk from which this screen snapshot was taken of the application that the BBC claims that they saw, that this is a uh, client-side app that you strip the person, and as you type each CAPTCHA, you get to strip them. Um, that's the best documentation I have of it. Yeah, go ahead. I've been hearing this anecdotally for years, but no Correct. Know and when I was doing the book, I followed up with Lewis. It was like, what's the deal here? And that's as solid as it is. And, you know, there you go. You've got to admit, though, if there were a Nobel Prize for evil, right? Like, I know there was Pol Pot, but this would be like a runner-up in the sheer genius category. And it's one of those things with, I'm not convinced that Luis isn't the person who brought it about. Because by speculating that you can do it, you know, you have one of those ideas like, there ought to be an internet service that delivers breath mints to you, you know, for free. And it's like, next week, Cosmo comes about. It's like, who knew? So, uh, yeah. So anyway, that kind of abuse I see coming about at the technical layer, too. So the Computer Emergency Response Team Coordination Center, for a while, until 2003, kept track of security incidents happening online. You'll see here that the... Uh, thing goes exponential about the time that many 
uh, people, including Americans, are going online with very powerful computers they get at Walmart, leave them on 24-7 and connect them to broadband so that should they get infected by uh, some form of malware, there's much more harm they can do as they seek out other machines or do whatever it is the malware instructs them to do. And the fact is, sorry, Ed. That's a good question. I don't know if the exponential part is literally the number of people simply going online or if it's disproportionately even a higher hockey stick um, thinking that per capita, you know, the factors I'm talking about. Yeah, and again, it ends at 2003, so it's even harder to know. Um, today, whether your platform is, you know, Mac, PC, or other, you've got a huge pile of crap running on your computer. And I defy anybody in this room to say with certainty what it is. And, you know, the, the true nerds in the room, I think, know and agree that, yeah, we have no clue what this is. This could be anything on the machine. Peekaboo seems particularly worrisome on that <laughs> Mac screen snapshot. And for the most part, under these architectures, they have the keys to the kingdom. They can do whatever they want on the machine once they're running. That's the magic of .exe. That's exactly what I was extolling about 10 minutes ago. But here it means that if any one of these executables has as a single extra line delete the hard drive, that's it. It deletes the hard drive. Or perhaps, again, in the evil genius category, and this is merely a suggestion. It hasn't happened yet to my knowledge, and I hope I'm not bringing it about. You could go through and look for spreadsheets on the hard drive and transpose numbers in random cells and then go back to sleep for a while so they can back it up a few times. And only when you run the payroll at the end of the month are you like, what? How many spreadsheets would have to be infected across how many machines that way before no one could trust any spreadsheet because you wouldn't know if the virus had hit it? Yes, sir? No, I have no questions. Okay, then. This is um, a screen snapshot of the command console of one of the botnet programs. You simply select from a number of uh, zombie computers that you've harvested when you'd like them to start attacking a given destination, when should they stop, who's the victim, and away you go. It's that kind of plug and play functionality that represents the evil side of the generative story that I've been telling. Network World, in an article that reads more like a Stephen King pot boiler than Network World, says that the storm worm is fighting back against security researchers who seek to destroy it. It retaliates by launching attacks against them, shutting down their access for days. As you try to investigate, it knows and it punishes. I've never seen anything like this before. I mean, that's the kind of situation that has some people, admittedly many of them in the very security industry that benefits from the kind of fear, uncertainty, and doubt that I'm echoing today, but that has them saying, it is a weird historical accident that what happens to be in front of us on these machines are general purpose, originally hobbyist machines with some of our most crucial data that are ready at the click of a mouse to download arbitrary code from anywhere in the world and run it with the keys to the kingdom. That is a crazy status quo. Met so far only with perimeter defense. You just kind of try to build the wall and keep out the bad stuff. And once something's in, it's like, you know, here it is. Have fun, everybody. And it's the kind of perimeter defense that if you try to put it to the user, it doesn't work very well. This is an email we got at Harvard Law School warning there's been an insurgence of fraudulent emails at the law school, some dead enders trying to infect your machine. It has a huge pile of advice that you know nobody will read, but I couldn't help but notice this one piece, which was to be weary of emails that have misspellings for grammar or odd characters. They are a red flag for fraud. I wrote back, I was like, I think I got one. <laughs> and now I'm at Oxford. You see something like this as you surf? I mean, this is one of the things, you have a security architecture that tries to put up some tripwires about sensitive things, and how do you act when the tripwire is triggered? You can't just deny everything because maybe the person's trying to get something done. So you give them a message like this. All right, so let's just figure it out. You're surfing on a Friday night, you're about to go to a website as you go and you see this. <laughs> How many of you want to proceed in this instance? How many say yes? <laughs> yeah, How many? It's the Princeton Computer Science website. This happens on the Princeton Computer yes. Science website. Yeah. <laughs> wow, Ed. I don't know what your answer will be to that. But. <laughs> How many say no? Huh. 
how many do the Dark Horse Candidate view certificates? Yeah. And it's like, cool, a certificate. The funny thing is, you look at it, and it's a certificate. Now, I'm sure Ed can piece back the trail that's like, well, it's a VeriSign Class D certificate. Boy, Mickey Mouse never got one of the, you know, that kind of thing. But for most of us, we could print out a damn certificate and put it on our wall, and whenever we want, incline our heads slightly to the right and view the certificate. Right? This is not informative to the average user. I'd like to think it's our democratic instinct because we have two green checks and only one exclamation point, a veto-proof majority in favor of continuing. But the fact is, we need to be Patriot missile batteries capable of 100% accuracy, at least no false negatives, as we try to intercept the bad code coming at us. This is not, in my view, a functional way of dealing with it. Automated solutions have their own zero-day exploit problems. New technologies complicate things more. This is my favorite Vista bug. It's the speech recognition hole. Because, you know, you don't want to have to move your elbow and click on the folder. You want to say, open the folder, and then the folder opens. And uh, so now you're visiting a website. And you know how you visit a MySpace page, it plays a song. You visit the website, it just plays, delete the hard drive. And you're like, no, no, don't delete the hard drive. Yes, delete the hard drive. <laughs> And you're in this existential battle with your machine. I mean, not a positive path. Or this counterintuitively named Chuck Roast website that sells fleece. You go to Chuck Roast to buy fleece, fine. But it turns out Chuck Roast, like at least 250,000 other webmasters, uh, has poor website security. So uh, a robot managed to guess his password or otherwise hack the website and injected exactly one line of code. This is it. It opens up an iframe in your unpatched browser of diminishingly small width and height, which injects the contents of the counterintuitively named iSecurePages.net, and that's it. You visit Chuck Roast, you're dead with the wrong browser. And you leave not even having purchased something and not realizing that you've been given a free bonus prize. Speaking of free bonus prizes, I think this situation is best summed up by the Cap and Crunch bosun's whistle a prize in a box of Cap'n Crunch cereal in the early 1970s. After you've sugared up your kid, why not have her run around the house and blow a whistle? <laughs> Turns out if you cover one hole of the whistle and blow, it emits a tone at 2600 hertz, which is exactly the tone used by AT&T, the monopoly telephone network at the time, to indicate an idle line. Call an 800 number, blow the whistle, dial a toll number, free long distance telephone calling. Boxes of Cap'n Crunch cereal start flying off the shelves. General Mills has a VisiCalc moment. Right? There's a new third-party app for our cereal. Who knew? <laughs> AT&T, as a monopolist, could fix this problem. What did they do? They started doing some elementary security, and they started implementing out-of-band signaling so that there was no sound you could utter as a consumer to instruct the network. Sound just got relayed to the other side. They fixed the problem. The Internet is still at exactly this space. The very channels that carry our emails and our web clicks and our files and our music and our chats are also the conduits that carry .exe. And we wouldn't want it any other way. Or would we? The question is, how bad does it have to get before we have to revisit the fundamental architecture that AT&T changed in the 1970s? The same is true, I claim, for internet architecture itself. Distributed routing so that you advertise what you're near as one of the routers in the network and people just listen to that advertisement and like in this case an ISP in Pakistan was asked to block YouTube for Pakistanis. It took a technical shortcut to do so by advertising itself to the world as you guys want YouTube? I'm sitting right on top of YouTube. Give me your packets yearning for cats flushing toilets and boy are you going to be happy. They take the packets, they throw it away and this starts propagating throughout the entire network. Now, the North American network operators group, Nanog, got on it, and within a couple hours, they'd figured out how to restore access to YouTube around the world. Imagine if just a handful of ISPs in a coordinated effort put bad routing information for 20,000 sites out at D-Day. You'd have a very different reaction. Richard Clark wrote a uh, tome, The National Strategy to Secure Cyberspace, in February of 2003 very long document, half of which was, you're all going to die, Digital Pearl Harbor. The second half of which was, we need a committee to fix this. Let's have an IT information sharing and analysis center 
So there's like Steve Case or Jack Bauer or somebody, and they talk to each other, and it's like, is the internet down? I think it is. Can we tell anybody? No, the internet's down. And like, that's it. <laughs> it's because the thing is distributed, right? What are you going to do? I sympathize. But this then is a real problem that, if not solved, I claim, will lead from a world that is happily mixed right now between the generative and the sterile. There's both floating around, and the world is better for it. I'm not against sterile. But it's a world that will cause us to reject, most of us, the generative at the heart of it. It means the end of the PC, either by locking down the PC the way it's already locked down in most corporate environments or in cyber cafes, so you can't install the flying toaster screensaver or Skype when you want to. You need permission from somebody to do it, and you have to provide a case for it, turning it into an IBM System 360. Or you simply start replicating most of your functions through information appliances like Sky Plus or TiVo or BlackBerry or many mobile phones, right? Here's the singular mobile phone. Does this look familiar, right? It's back. The Kindle, the iPod pictured here in its native Naga hide coating, the iPhone. What a great example of the iPhone. And there it is, right? The return of brother, the CompuServe main menu, right back again, and we want it. This is gorgeous. It's like, Nemo can't be bad, right? <laughs> That's the kind of thing that had Steve Jobs saying, you're right. This is what you want, people, and I'm going to give it to you. The last thing you want is for this thing to be like a PC, because we know the deal with PCs. I'm giving you the un-PC. And when people around these parts started hacking it and jailbreaking it and all that kind of thing, one, Apple threatens to brick it. Two, they say, all right, we'll think about a software development kit. We'll think about making a radio that maybe gives you a couple extra stations other than the Steve Jobs Comedy Hour. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But I want to first dwell for a second on the impact of a new generation of devices that are not simply sterile, as I've just described, but are what I call tethered. And by that I mean third parties can't change them, but the vendor can any time after the point of sale because they're internet aware and they can be reprogrammed at a distance uniquely by the vendor. Two examples of this. One, the little known case of TiVo versus EchoStar. In TiVo versus EchoStar, TiVo just having successfully defended against a claim of patent infringement, turns around and sues EchoStar for patent infringement. EchoStar makes a DVR kind of like the TiVo, here it is, pictured. They try it in Texas where plaintiffs always win and TiVo wins. EchoStar owes TiVo $90 million in damages for the infringement. TiVo, in sealed briefs, asks for more and gets it in an order that follows. Among other things, <laughs> EchoStar is ordered within 30 days to disable the DVR functionality in all but a handful, and I can explain in Q&A why, of the installed units already in living rooms across America. So you have your EchoStar DVR, you've taped Felicity, and then you wake up one morning and you've had a feature upgrade. You now have an Echo Brick. That's due to the order by the judge in Texas. You have a level of regulability previously not achievable in the other generative technological landscape. And of course, you can't just kill the machine. You could go forward and do more. You could change the machine so that if there were a part of the Simpsons held to defame somebody or infringe copyright, you could demand that the judge order TiVo to reach into all TiVos containing that Simpsons and slice out the offending content. There's no reason you couldn't do that under American law, and that's the kind of platform that these things are offering. Another example, another little-known case. I don't know how many people have OnStar in their car. It provides GPS functionality as well as a microphone you speak into here in the rearview mirror. So you run into trouble, you press the Swiss flag, and you're like, I've fallen and I can't get up. And then this lady is like, don't worry, we know where you are, we're sending help. Great functionality. Functionality that came at issue in the little known case of, yes, the company versus the United States of America, <laughs> reminiscent of some of the obscenity cases we study in law school, like US versus three reels of eight millimeter film. It's like, if the US can't win that case, we have no business being in foreign wars. <laughs> so the company, versus the United States of America arises when the FBI asks an anonymous car service provider company to reprogram the OnStar system at a distance to flip on the microphone at all times inside the car containing people of interest. 
They get in the car, they turn it on, they drive around. Everything they say relayed to the FBI without even the need of one of those trucks with the people inside with donuts and the alligator clips and all that kind of stuff. Just plug and play functionality. They do it. They realize that this could be a threat to their business model if word gets out, and they threaten a secret, uh, they file a secret case, which is why it's a company versus the United States. They lose in the district court an opinion under seal. They appeal to the Ninth Circuit, and they win on the thinnest basis possible. The Ninth Circuit says that because the way the FBI asked them to do it meant that if the bad people in the car hit the help button, it wouldn't go to the lady, it would only go to the FBI, who presumably would not help, that is not cool. So if you could rework it so that at all times it goes to the FBI except when you press the help button, at which point it goes to both, that would be fine. That's now the state of the law, at least the law that isn't secret that we know of in the country. Other examples, uh, somewhat ambiguous reported of the FBI asking that cell phones be turned into roving bugs, not just when you're on the phone, but just generally connecti- collecting ambient noise as you walk around. And you start to realize how our consumer choice has created a framework for surveillance far more pervasive and convenient than anything the government might do through, say, CCTV cameras or other centrally funded mandates. I won't even uh, comment on this. I'm just going to keep going. Okay, so I don't think it's just a dichotomy between the sterile on the one hand and the generative on the other. I think we're entering a world where Steve Jobs realizes that generative has good business possibilities. It's the same reason Bill Gates made Windows as open as it is. But also sees that if you can let enough energy in to get the platform off the ground and then close the door behind, maybe you get the best of both worlds. Even with a closed iPod, $3 billion a year market, $1 billion a year market in iPod accessories, such as this lovely dancing dog that you can play while you have your iPod. $1 $1 billion a year in stuff like this. In fact, the British just launched a destroyer which has iPod docks and surround sound built in. Cost of the destroyer, $1 billion, doubling the market in iPod accessories in only one year. <laughs> so Steve Jobs comes along and says, all right, we've heard what you want, people. We're going to get a software development kit. Let the generativity flow. Third-party nerds can write stuff. You write software for it, though? How do you transfer it? It must go through the iPhone apps store, where they take a cut of whatever you're getting. And if you get it for free, they take a cut of free, which is nothing. But here's a grainy visage. Whenever it's Steve Jobs, it gets grainy. I don't understand that. Um, As he presents this a couple weeks ago, he says, are there limitations? Absolutely. He gets to decide what appears in the store and what doesn't. Malicious stuff, gone. Illegal stuff, gone. Privacy invasion, gone. Porn, gone. Bandwidth hog, gone. And I love this catch-all category of unforeseen. (laughs) We wouldn't want any surprises in the iPhone store. So if there's anything we haven't mentioned here that's a problem, gone. That's the kind of control that turning what had been a product into a service facilitates. And that's why when a very untechy colleague said to me, as I was talking about some of the worries of generative systems, he said, you know, we license our cosmetologists. Before somebody can shampoo your hair, They need a license from the state. And we're still under the illusion that we live in a free world. Why shouldn't we license our coders who are far more powerful and can affect that many more people? And I was like, huh. I mean, it's a terrible idea, right? It's the worst idea ever. And yet, I wasn't sure what to tell them. And then I realized, as I say, the Matrix Sergeant, your men are already dead. We already have a licensing scheme, not run by the Board of Cosmetology but by a new set of intermediaries who provide new platforms that are the Apple II and Windows machines of our day. The poorly dressed, smiley, asocial nerds are not coding for Windows or Mac or Linux anymore, in my view. They're coding for the Facebook platform. They don't read the fine print, it's just fun. Facebook or the parallel platforms like Google Mashups is where where it's at. So something like Scrabulous takes off when it gets coded for Facebook. What does Facebook say about its use of the platform to a developer? Well, at any time, they can immediately kill your app, at which point you promise to disgorge anything you've learned from the Facebook entries that your app touches. They reserve the right to charge a fee at any time for using the platform. 
and calculate it however they want. You have the right to quit if you don't like the fee. That's so generous of them. They don't just skip you with a bill that you have to pay for an undetermined amount for what you've done. It's not like cell phone minutes kind of thing. But it's like an all-you-can-eat buffet where it's like they set the price later, and if you don't like it, you can regurgitate everything you've eaten. <laughs> you represent warrant and covenant to us that your content will not be obscene, defamatory, fraudulent, or otherwise illegal in any jurisdiction. So if you're planning to like insult the Thai King app, better not put it on Facebook. Can you imagine if these were the Windows developers' terms of service? Can you imagine if that was the Windows developer terms of service? Bill Gates is like, Intuit, you're doing really well with Quicken. How about a million dollars, you know? And we'll be back sometime later for more. Thanks a lot, right? Kind of crazy, but also beneficial. When the secret crush, wildly popular Facebook app that no one admits to installing, was found to be installing adware, Within several days, Facebook's like, that's it. You're out of here, right? This is a controlled platform in a good way. All of the generative problems I was talking about before, much more tackleable on these kinds of platforms. And of course, other regulators can then get in, not just for malicious code. Scrabulous is seen to be infringing Hasbro's trademarks. Hasbro then chases after these Indian brothers. They tell Hasbro to go to hell. We're in India, you can't reach us. They literally said that. And um, the lawyers then say, great, we're going to Facebook. Zuckerberg, take it down. Facebook's like, uh, right? They don't know what to do. Still spinning the wheel on that one. Even privacy fanatics and academics, not necessarily an overlapping group, um, note that when you add an app, right? We have no idea what this crap means. We just sometimes randomly uncheck the boxes if we find an application to be skeevy. But you put it in. And they say, you know, so many of these applications, like the throw a chair at someone app, don't need access to your data. But when you add them as an app, you usually give them access to all your data. That's a huge privacy concern. What do they recommend? Why? They say that Facebook should be much more of an intermediary fronting the data in and out. So that Facebook is that much more crucial to its own platform and harder to separate from the applications created. All right, let me just say a few words about what I think we should do about it and then open it up to discussion. So far what I've talked about is a generative pattern of stuff that starts in a backwater that seems kind of nerdy, stupid, and cat-like, but then ends up with great success, gets great usage, and then because of the usage, you end up with people saying, wait a minute, we now have something to lose. We need some form of enclosure. My hope is to find a way to use the pattern to save the pattern. And I have a few thoughts on this that might even be borrowing from some of the tactics, technologies, and social tactics related, implemented at one layer, helping at another. You know, Wikipedia has managed to survive its first round of success in a vandalism. I don't know if it will forever, but so far it has. And I think we can borrow a little bit from Wikipedia's functionality that is actually represented to me by a crazy um, Dutch traffic engineer named Hans Monderman who came up with Verkeersbergridge, or unsafe is safe. And his idea was to get rid of nearly all traffic laws and signs in a given neighborhood. And his counterintuitive uh, uh, prediction was that people would actually drive more carefully and the accident rate would go down if they were asked to see each other as humans that might hurt each other rather than people on their way to work that have rules to follow and might or might not break them. This is uh, his vision implemented in South Kensington and London. It's been a staggering success. Will it work in Mexico City? Probably not. It relies on norms as well as on certain technologies and architectures. But if you can get them in the right combination, this can be far more powerful. And Wikipedia has this. You read the Global Warming article, it's pretty damn good. And it has ways of easily reverting vandalism so it's not tragic if something should go wrong. It'd be great to have a similar system if your spreadsheets should find their numbers transposed. And it has discussion behind the scenes so that people can actually, in an incredibly pre-postmodern way, ascribe to meta-principles like a neutral point of view and then argue with each other over what's right and wrong with some hope of persuading each other. Like, how incredibly naive. And yet, this is what leads to a core of Wikipedians, all of whom feel ownership in the project and see it as a personal affront when something's vandalized and want to fix it or create robots to fix it. Speaking of robots, we have just the hints, glimmerings 
of trying to express social preference through protocol. This particular protocol, not approved by any standards organization, is a way to indicate for your website whether you would like crawlers like Google or Yahoo to investigate certain directories. And directories are publicly available. You just don't want them searchable. Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, all respect requests by websites not to have certain directories crawled. This has eliminated 99%, not 100, but 99% of the conflicts that otherwise would have come up. And in the absence of a technical architecture to express your preference, the judges would have to decide it one way or the other with a default rule making very few people happy. That's where we're at on Google Books right now because there's no easy way to tag a book as to whether or not you want it part of the Google Books project. It's where we're at on privacy right now. So here's this website that makes fun of old Olin Mills photographs. And um, this is like backdrop number four, a bucolic meadow with split rail. Is that an animal carcass behind her? And you're like, yeah, you know, I think that is a dead cow right behind her. That's kind of weird. And so there's bunches of photos, each funnier than the next. And then you can count one of them. I don't know what it said, but the owner asked the snarky person, would you mind? Like, I'd prefer not to have that. And the person said yes. Right now, when we encounter photos and stuff on the net, it's just disaggregated data. There's no social sense behind it. If we had a protocol to indicate what you'd like to have happen to your photo, or whether you'd like to be asked before certain things happen, the way the Creative Commons was invented to help express what your intellectual property assertions are with respect to it, or preferences, you give people a chance to do the right thing. Who knows if all of them will? Not all of them on Wikipedia do, there are vandals but have an architecture that lets people make that choice. Right now we are deprived of it because we don't know what this data is, so we just use it, pell-mell. These are the kinds of solutions I'd like to see that would facilitate blunting the worst aspects of these technologies so long as there are shared values and people willing to uphold them. I could easily see having some RFID or other indicator as to how you'd like to see yourself portrayed if there were enough of a technical architecture to let people easily respect others' wishes in many cases, people might well choose to use it. Um, StopBadWare.org is another example of trying to harness the goodwill of the crowd to do certain things. It has a couple instantiations. It's a project of Harvard and Oxford funded by Sun, Google, Lenovo, and HP. And um, one example is to let people download basically spyware equivalent code that gathers the vital signs of their machines and relays them back and basically can try to say how happy is the herd right now. I've encountered a new software that's going to let my hamster dance. It just wants to install an active X control. Do you want to do it? And I can say, well, how many in the herd have installed it before? How many who describe themselves as experts have installed it versus people who don't know what they're doing? Hmm, maybe I should pass on the Jessica Simpson screensaver. Enough of a dashboard to let neophytes like four-wheel drive or two-wheel drive make certain basic decisions according to their risk preference. Another instantiation of this app under development among us is to chart internet filtering. We took $5 million from the MacArthur Foundation to manually check internet filtering in 50 states around the world. It just came out as access denied. Buy the book, see the movie. But what we really want to do is have a functionality so people as they're surfing if they can't get to a website, can say, why can't I get there from here? And the act of asking the question helps answer it. Because enough people saying, why can't I get there from here, with the network topology tells you, everybody in China can't get to X, and everybody else is not complaining. Wow, maybe we can infer something about this site's treatment in China. And then you can go to a site called Am I Blocked or Not? And it will tell you the reports as they come in, and you can contribute your own view as to whether or not you can see the site. Those are the kinds of solutions that we want to see. Another example of it is the clearinghouse of malware URLs. Google sends a robot around the web looking for sites like the Chuck Roast website that have the drive-by downloads, nearly 300,000 of them found. When they find them, they add them to Stop Badware's list of Santa's bad sites. But in addition, they end up in the Google search engine warning people away. So my good colleague, Yochai Benkler, wrote The Wealth of Networks and put it into a wiki. Somebody added the wiki to include a virus. The Googlebot found the virus. And then you search for the wealth of networks and you get this extra note from Google that says it may harm your computer. If you're feeling brave and you click on it anyway, instead of taking you to the site, it takes you to this page that says, no, really, you'd be an idiot to go to the site, have a cream soda, do anything but go to the site. If you're crazy, you can highlight the link and paste it in, but we take no responsibility. Suddenly, Chuck Brost's incentives are inverted. 
and the man who just wanted to sell me a fleece when I was trying to tell him that his site had been hacked, now was calling me on my cell phone saying, what do I need to do to restore the 90% of my traffic that just got killed? Now you can see all sorts of problems with this, but in brief, and there's just the last three slides, Internet starts out in PC in basically this zone with hierarchy, a single system on the one hand or many competing systems on the other, top down meaning sterile or bottom up meaning generative in my lexicon, and Internet is polyarchical both competing with CompuServe and the source and AOL and allowing contributions from all corners. The only part of the Internet that's hierarchical is that narrow middle of the hourglass, but most of the rest, the bottom and the top, over here in the bottom-up polyarchy category. You then end up with problems that emerge, the generative pattern problems. Our first instinct, especially as lawyers and regulators, is, uh-oh, we need to flee north. We need to either go into top-down polyarchy, which is the market, Norton, McAfee, uh, McAfee, whoever, compete in your polyarchical way to solve my problem, but I want your solution, cash and carry, or we aim for hierarchy top-down. Give me a solution from government that just makes a law that says bad things are illegal. I want to investigate how we can use this corner. This to me is bottom up, still generative, but to treat certain problems coming with certain agreements, whether social norms or things like stop badware, where we have a reference <coughs> list with the 800 pound gorilla like Google to try to fix the problems. This I say is the best first stop before recourse to the top-down world because it preserves the generative infrastructure that I claim is so good. Now, are there problems with this corner? You bet. There are problems it can't solve, and there are problems that have to do with government up here has, in a liberal rule of law environment, certain limitations on its own behavior that may not apply down here. That's why Chuck Roast has told me that I created the Gitmo of the Internet. He doesn't know how to do an appeal. He doesn't know where he's supposed to go. He's losing business. There's some org that has condemned him rather than a .gov and it's very scary to him and I totally credit it. And we have to figure out how to reconcile some of the values from up here into projects that go down there. But make no mistake, stuff will be gamed and unless we can come up with social solutions down here, we're left with some pretty unsavory alternatives. People probably use dig in this room. I don't know how many of you have seen subvert and profit where for two dollars you can buy a dig. Give them a PayPal, you want 1,000 digs, give them $2,000. Half of it goes to subvertandprofit.com. The other half goes to the individual diggers who have signed up to collect a dollar for digging something. That to me shows that dig, which is not exactly a .org, it's over on this side of things, I'd say. Um, dig is, uh, I was just going to say something about dig. What was I going to say about dig? Um, it's something where the community doesn't feel ownership. That's what I was going to say. That they like it, but they're still kind of conscious that there's a man called dig.com and they're separate from it. Same with Yelp. You might be a Yelper. I don't have any elite Yelpers in here, but it's pretty cool to knock Yelp even as you're addicted to it and doing it. Wikipedia, a little different. People feel themselves as Wikipedians rather than just free brains harnessed by a .com that has figured out something about bottom up. So um, norms don't always work. People don't agree, they don't agree. That's why efforts like uh, these of the British intellectual property industry to have school children start respecting copyright by putting the symbol on their own coursework are doomed to failure. Um, but the alternatives are worse, right? This is the upper left corner. People are abusing the carpool lane. I guess we need roadside cameras to detect blood so that we can see if you've got a dummy in the seat. You know, and then pretty soon people have slaughtered pigs in the passenger seat. I guess if it's Britain, they'll have them here in the passenger seat, you know, in order to get past the camera. That's not the way to go. What I want to see the community-based solutions tried first to many of the problems that we have. That's the name of the book and the talk. Let's open a discussion. Thank you very much.